The 1980s were a great time to be alive if you were interested in technology, because it felt like there was always something new coming out that you hadn't seen before. And that's probably because there was always something new coming out that you hadn't seen before. However, not all those products that were launched proved successful. And we're going to have a look at one of the ones that fell on the wrong side of the success fence here today. You might not have seen one of these before. Most people probably haven't. This is the cord machine from Sony. It came out in 1982, only in Japan. And as a category, it tends to be listed under boom boxes, but it's both more and less than a boom box at the same time. It's a very strange device, and normally with things you can kind of understand where the manufacturer was coming from when they introduced it, what market they were trying to aim the thing at. With this one, it's a little bit too bizarre and or limited for pretty much anyone that I could think of. However, the fact that this is an unusual one-off is what makes it worth talking about 40 years later. So let's have a look. Okay, let me show you what's inside. So in the top, we've got our stereo speakers and that is it. There's nothing else going on in here. This is just an empty section that's not being used for anything. So we'll have a look down in the bottom. Okay, so dividing this into two halves, starting on the left here, this is the normal section. So we've got a stereo radio cassette deck, a bit of a plasticky type of mechanism. However, pretty decent as well. Auto music search on here, record, pause, FM, AM radio, full frequency range, 76 up to 108 on FM. This is the on off switch, which also is the mode control to choose between the radio and the cassette and this section over here. We've got a mic mixing, tuning dial, FM, AM switch, volume, balance and tone. So that's just all normal really. But going over to this, this is where things get a bit odd because this is, well, it, what is it? It's kind of like a musical instrument. It just does chords though. You'll see we've got the numbers here, one through to 12. So this isn't a normal keyboard that you could play if you were able to play a keyboard. This is something where you'd press a button to hear a particular tone. You can shift into different uh, octaves with these buttons here. And also you can choose between three and four time up here for the drum machine. We've got a number of preset beats and you can adjust the speed of those there as well. Um, it does a little bit more than that, but not all that much. But for me to demonstrate it, I'd have to plug the top half into the bottom first of all, because this section up here, I should just show you, this doesn't attach to the bottom at all. There's nothing going between those. It's just a set of speakers that clips on the top of here. So if I just pop them back on again, to get the sound to go from this bottom half up to the top, you have to pull the wires out of the top and then plug them into the bottom. They plug into these sockets at the back here. So that's the left and the right. Then we've got microphone inputs, mic mixing. That's to plug a guitar into as well. And then around the front here, we've got a headphone output. Oh, and there's also a socket up here to plug a remote control foot pedal into. Now, once you've got the cable out of this storage section, you can close the door on it while still having it coming out of the bottom, but it does stick out of the side of the machine like that whenever you want to use it. Also, you notice at the top here, we've got these things. Those operate a little clip at the top, which is what uh, latches the thing close. There's one of these at either side. And if we just go to the other end, we've got the AC power input, of course, 100 volts being a Japanese model, DC nine volts, and above those, we've got a telescopic aerial. And that comes out of the side and then hinges up like that. And it can also be powered from six D cells. Now, I purchased this as is untested from a Japanese auction site. It's no doubt been sitting around for many years without being used. So I was surprised to find that the cassette deck will actually play a tape. I thought the belts might have been perished, but that's working okay. There are issues though, as far as the fast forward and rewind goes, uh, very sluggish. So no doubt it does need some new belts in here. How easy those are to replace, I don't know. It might not be something I do today, but there are some other things that I do need to do before I can properly demonstrate it to you. At the moment, you're just hearing the left-hand speaker. If I turn the balance over to the right, that's what's coming out of the right-hand side here. If I wiggle the connector, I can get it to come on. 
but only briefly. And I don't think that's to do with oxidization. I think there's a broken solder joint on there. I wouldn't be surprised given that these things hang out of the side and they're plugged in more often than not. They're just going to get banged at some point and that solder joint's going to come uh, apart. So I think that needs resoldering. I'm going to be taking the base off anyway though, not only just to look at the belts and that, but also for the on off switch because it's really flaky. I have to wobble it like a dozen times before it comes on. And again, that will be oxidization there. And as far as the rest of the controls here goes, there's quite a bit of crackling. So I might as well spray those with deoxy as well. So the next job with this thing is to open it up and have a look inside. All right, so there's seven screws in the top here. There's also one hidden in the battery compartments as well. So I'll just take all those out and hopefully this bottom section then will just lift off and give us a good view inside. The layout in here is really nice and clean. Everything's spaced out, very easy to access. Over on the right, we've got the power section, we've got the radio and the amplifier going up to the cassette deck that's held in the top. Just the one rubber drive belt on there. I don't know if that's something I'll be able to resolve today. I might not even look at it because it's not essential for me to be able to demonstrate this thing working. What is essential though are these inputs and outputs, getting those so that they get a good contact. So I'm gonna have a look at those. There's just two screws to take that board out. And then over here, on this side. This is the synthesizer type section. We'll have a look at the chips and things on there in a moment. But first, I'm going to have a look at these sockets. Let me just break out the macro lens so that you can see what I'm seeing. And we're looking at this pin here, and you can see if I waggle it, that's what's loose there. So that's what's causing the problem. So let's just solder it back on again. Now this one is a little bit awkward to get to, but this is the main on off. And I found that to get it going, I had to do that a lot of times in the middle. So obviously it was getting stuck somehow. Now it's all attached to this plastic section here, which is something I don't really want to take out. So I think I'm just gonna spray it and uh, wiggle it about and hope for the best. Well, that seems to have done the trick. I've just put some batteries in and you can see that red light come on straight away when I move it into that center position. It wasn't doing that before, that was the issue. So we've got a perfect contact there now. I've had second thoughts about this belt. It is a little bit dry and therefore prone to slipping. If I just hold it lightly, we can stop the whole thing moving, but the motor is still spinning. So I think I'll replace that. Now I've had a look through my belts and more often than not I don't have one that's the right size. However this time I think I do, so let's put it on. Now I haven't measured it, I've just eyeballed it, but it looks about right to me, so we'll find out. Let's just take this cover off. There we go. Right, so that's our old belt. Let's just compare the two for size. Yeah, the old one's actually a little bit bigger than the one I've got. Has it stretched or should it be that size? We'll find out. Don't want to put too much strain on this thing, so if this is too small for it, I'll find a different one instead. It seems about right, that, to me, you know. I don't want it any looser than that. Now, of course, it's a square belt. We need to get it to spin a bit so that it untangles itself. There we go. Seems like a good fit to me, that. It might even improve my fast-forward and rewind. Maybe there was just a bit too much torque on there. Okay, let's take a look at this section here. This is the back of the chord generator slash drum machine. Things that Sony aren't really known for manufacturing, as far as I can think of anyway. But there's uh, a couple of things labelled on here. Expander, tempo clock, sustain adjustment, select key, noise generator, chord block. But I think we need to flip this over to have a better look at it. And it also says... Rhythm block there, I missed that one before, but this should now come out hopefully. I think I need to unplug these things here. And then we've got a grey one here. There's one little ground cable here that's spoiling our fun, so I just need to desolder that. Now I flipped this over because I wanted to get to these pots to spray a bit of contact cleaner in them, but while we've got it in this orientation, you can see the various chips that Sony use for this synthesizer, in inverted commas, section. Well, it kind of is a synth, it's just a one that can only play chords. There's also a drum machine in here, so you might be interested in looking at some of the numbers on the chips. I'll show you some pictures I've taken that make them a little bit clearer, but Sony weren't really renowned for making synthesizers. There were a couple of little drum machines that they dabbled with, and I think they did a synth or two, but not really their main market. So a bit of an unusual device, this one. Okay, I'm just gonna put this back on the top. I'm not gonna screw it in place yet because I wanna make sure that everything's working first.
Yeah, perfect, no problems there at all. Let's just see if this thing can fast forward and rewind there though. I doubt it, but we'll have a look. Oh yeah, that's fine. No problems there at all. Let's try rewind. Yeah, that's good and strong as well. So yeah, absolutely no problems with this part now. So we've sorted out the cassette radio section. Let's move on and have a look at the strange right-hand side of this device. Okay, now we're moving on to this section here, the part that makes this device interesting. However, I noticed a problem and I've just spent 10 minutes taking the thing apart, playing around with it, and I've realized what the issue is. It's the location. It doesn't work properly if I play it here. Just have a listen to the drum machine. I don't know if you can hear that. It's got a kind of metallic twang to it. Now, I'm sure I wasn't doing that before, so I was playing around with it, trying to figure out if I damaged something when I took it apart. And it isn't that, it's down to where it's being played. It's this location. Just have a listen while I move it around. Now, after a bit of head scratching, I figured out what the problem is. This device does not like being in the same location as my Wi-Fi router. That's quite nearby in here. Now, instead of me switching it off and affecting loads of different things around the house, I'm going to move this to a different location. I've got to say a little bit short-sighted of Sony, not making the product prepared for 802.11 and 5 gigahertz, but I'll let them off. So I'm going to move this into a different place. We'll be able to play it back properly with all the sounds coming through as they should. I'll go through the drum machine section and then the chords, and then I'm going to come back here. So let's get on and do that. Okay, now you're going to have to overlook the lack of musical terminology I'm going to use here because I haven't got a clue, but let's just go through the basics. On the left-hand side, we've got three time and four time. Along the top, those are the rhythms. So let's pick one of those in three time. And now from there, we can adjust the beats per minute using the top right control. Now, if this isn't too much excitement for you, I'm just going to work my way through the various rhythms. Okay, I feel I've drummed home the rhythm section there, so now let's move down. The four buttons below there access the various chord modes. That was a bit loud, but you're able to adjust the balance between the chord and the rhythm. There's three more chord options to work our way through, so let's have a go. And I should mention that it can only play one note at a time. And believe it or not, that is pretty much all that it does. The only thing left to show is that you can adjust the pitch of the note using this control in the middle.
Okay, so there you go. Now, I think I've demonstrated pretty much everything it does, except perhaps there are a couple of modifiers on here which only work in some modes. For example, if I just press a note now, and I can press that one, it makes it higher. But there's these two as well, which don't necessarily work with all the modes. That's not changing anything. But if I put it into this one, You get the idea. So in different modes, these buttons affect the pitch or the knocking up an octave or that kind of thing. Um, but I haven't got the full instructions for this, unfortunately, but I think I've pretty much figured out what it does. And as you can see, it doesn't really do all that much. Now, the original promotional brochure from 1982 featured some accessories that you could get for your chord machine, including various microphones, as well as that foot pedal that I mentioned earlier on. But I believe that when you bought one of these in the box, you also got a songbook included with it, and you can see an extract from how that would have looked at the bottom of the brochure here. Here we've got three different songs that increase in complexity. The idea is that you'd pick a rhythm and then a chord mode and set the tempo. And then you'd play back the appropriate chords for a song by following the numbers that are listed at the bottom above the lyrics. Now the ability to play chords is not something that I'd imagine appealing to a massive load of people. So I would have thought to make this appeal to the general public, they would have had some kind of interaction between the chord section and the cassette or the radio. But it's not the case. If you put this into the radio mode, you know what a twit you are. The chords switch off, and if you put it into the tape, the same thing happens. You can play your tape back, but you can't play along to it. The one exception to that is if you plug a microphone into this, you can plug the mic in and then play some chords along to it. Okay, so I've got the microphone turned on now, and this is the master volume here. You can hear a bit of feedback there. And then this is the mic mixing volume. So if I turn it all the way down, there's no mic being brought in and all the way up there, it's being mixed in with, well, whichever device I'm using at the time. At the moment, it's a synth type area over here. So I can play a chord along with my speech. Let's just bring my speech up a little bit and the volume of the chord down. Right, so there you go. So I suppose we could um, have some atmospherics and his name was Dracula. Now the microphone remains live when you switch this into the radio mode. So I suppose you could sing along with the radio if you had the appropriate thing to listen to. More likely you'd probably put it into the cassette mode and put some karaoke tape on. And then you could uh, sing along with that as well. There's no kind of reverb echo effects on this. So it's quite a rudimentary karaoke machine, but you can mix the level of your mic in with it. So, um, yeah, it could be used for that, but it does seem like a missed opportunity that this section here is totally dead whenever anything over here is being used. And another missed opportunity is the fact that this doesn't have a normal piano style keyboard. Whilst it's only capable of playing one note at a time, there were plenty of basic synthesizers around in the early 80s that operated like that. And at least with those, you could play a tune on them. With this, you've got no hope because it's just mapped out completely differently. And another thing I think they should have done on this is enable this to be used as a drum machine. Imagine each of these had a different drum sound behind them. Of course, it's capable of making those sounds. So it's a shame that they didn't have a drum machine mode where you could tap out rhythms on this. There are a couple of things that they could have easily added on here, which would have made it at least half useful. So there you go, the Sony CFS C7. Bit of a strange one, this, in a category all of its own, I think, because I've seen it listed under boomboxes in various articles, but I would not call this a boombox by any conventional sense. I think of a boombox as something with a handle on it, with speakers on the side that you can play while you're walking around. Well, you can't do that with this. I mean, the speakers, when you walk around with it, it's all closed up. You have to plug those into the side to be able to hear anything, and then you can separate them out if you want, or you can keep them attached to the device, but it's, it's not something you carry around while listening to it. As far as using it as kind of a mini hi-fi in your house, it's not a bad idea, the way you can put the speakers separate to the main unit, but it's certainly not the boombox form factor as far as I'm concerned. Now, as far as what it is, well, that's a bit of a difficult one to categorise, because it's... Um, like a mini hi-fi system in a way with your stereo radio cassette and your speakers that bit all works fine it's like a tale of two halves as far as the musical side of this thing goes though that is a bit of an odd one because i don't know who'd really want to be 
using that, I mean, I'm not a musician, so this perhaps flies a bit over my head, or a long way over my head. The advert seems to suggest somebody playing a guitar into this and playing chords along with it. I mean, maybe musicians can comment and say if that is something that they would have found appealing. There were a number of boomboxes back in the day, more than you might think, that had a keyboard built into them. And it made perfect sense because what do you need in your keyboard? You need uh, your speakers, power supply, maybe batteries and an amplifier. Well, all those things are already in your boombox. So it makes more sense just to add a keyboard onto a boombox then you've got two things converged into one unit so a number of manufacturers did come out with those as far as this goes you can't even really play a proper tune on it or at least i can't i haven't reviewed any of those boomboxes with keyboards on by the way because i cannot play the keyboard i'm not musically minded now there are other people who are and i'll link you in the video description to a review a review of one of those uh, but when i've looked to see if anyone who is more musically minded than myself who has one of these on YouTube has been able to get it to do anything that sounded half decent. The only video clips that I could find were people that made it just sound as bad as I can make it sound. Even people who seem to be very proficient with synthesizers. So it seems like this wasn't really suitable for anyone as far as I can make out, but that is what makes it interesting. It's a weird device from the past. There was nothing like it before or since, and therefore it's worth making a video about. And I hope you've enjoyed having a look at it here today, but that's it for the moment. As always, Thanks for watching.